fellow classic TV fans, and welcome to the season four premiere of Retro TV Radio. I'm your host, Pat McCormack. Kent McCord is nothing less than a living legend. It's no secret that this ageless Adam-12 star, along with his co-star and dear friend, the late Martin Milner, inspired many to pursue careers in law enforcement. Not only that, through the vision of Robert Senator and Jack Webb, Adam-12 the series and Kent's performance as Officer Jim Reed helped solidify the television genre known as police procedurals. But McCord's experiences on television and the business itself go far deeper than just this classic show. Just wait until you hear him tell the tale of how his prominent career was kicked off. And that is a pun intended. We not only discuss the buddy cop formula, but laugh about a few ironies along the way. Among other interesting subjects, we also discuss his deep connections to the Screen Actors Guild as the former vice president, his passion and expertise on the state of the industry, and the newest SAG deal will have you not only intrigued, but well-educated. Kent pulls no punches as he takes social media, YouTube, and artificial intelligence to task. This all the while enlightening us on many of the new details of the settlement, which includes his opinion on whether it was a good one or a bad one. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podcast, the legendary Kent McCord. Hi, Kent. How you doing? Well, I'm doing fantastic because, heck, I'm talking to one of my childhood heroes. Oh, well, thank you very much. That's that's uh, always nice to hear. I was thinking you probably never heard that one before, but... <laughs> Well, you know, one of the flattering things of, of being in this business for a long time is you, you do get different generations of people who who were acquainted with you through our medium television or from motion pictures so you know it's always it's always flattering that people have taken the time no matter what generation to tune in sure well it's funny because i i was thinking about all the different ways i could introduce you and i was one came across it's like i know i'll say the dashing kent mccord <laughs> <laughs> and i thought but coming from a heterosexual guy, I'm not sure how he might take that. <laughs> With flattery. Yes, good. Well, I, I had just watched the, that skit of you and Marty on Laugh-In. Yes. <laughs> and it is so good. Where you profess as Officer Reed. I love you. Yes. <laughs> Get out of my car. <laughs> well, you know, truthfully, the way that that developed uh, was very interesting. Marty lived in Fallbrook, and Marty would come up to the the studio and stay in the studio for the time that we shot that particular episode of television. So we never shot on Monday. So Marty would come up Monday night. We'd go to our our barber and and get our hair cut for that episode on Monday on Monday night and we'd begin on Tuesday morning and then every other Friday we shot the interior of the car from the two previous episodes so every other week there was a Friday involved and so when we were doing the laugh-in gig we went from the studio over to NBC and Marty wanted to get on the road and get back to Fallbrook he didn't want to be have it be too late, <laughs> and as was my uh, weakness at that point, certain things would set me off with giggling, <laughs> and that was one of them. And it wasn't planned, and it just happened. It was organic, and I think that's the charm of the thing. And interestingly, that I think we did the first episode of season five of Laugh In, and the first episode of season six, and the same thing happened. On, on season six and then there were a couple other times that we were we were on laugh in and they just let it roll uh, we thought they were just going to take you know the one take that worked and uh instead it wound up being the full thing which is which is really interesting another another thing about what happens with television these days and with streaming and the ability to to see almost anything uh Free TV had all 
140 episodes of Laugh In on. Re- and, and my wife and I, during the pandemic, and being you know, sequestered and careful about where we went and what we did, uh, we started watching Laugh In. And I realized I had never seen all of the episodes of Laugh In. I'd see it once in a while, but uh, I hadn't seen them all. And they were all available, so we started at season one. And uh, Laugh-In was on Tuesday nights at 10 o'clock. So we were shooting out of 12 during that whole period of time. And I was in bed by 10 o'clock because you have to be up at 5 and at the studio and the whole thing. And, and they, are, they are so amazingly funny. And I don't know that anybody could ever attempt to re- – well, they could attempt, but I don't think they could ever – uh, come up with the charm and the hilarity that uh, that Laugh In contains in those in those original shows. It's just amazing. Sure, sure, and it's it's the spontaneity too. I mean, yeah, I, like I, like you were saying when I watched that, you could tell it was bloopers in real time, and yeah, <laughs> how valuable that must have been to them. They must have just been, oh, this is gold. Yeah. I mean, because, yeah. of course, you're these straight lies. You don't play. Well, let me take that back. Even on the show, you were kind of the comic relief. I mean, you would have your dry, deadpan one-liners between yeah. calls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, well, but, you know, and that and that, and the other the other end of that, you know, when I turn to Marty and I say, I love you, uh, <laughs> Marty Milner was one of the best things that ever happened to me. In life. Uh-huh. And, and uh, our families, when we started doing the show, meshed and we did vacations together. And, you know, we were down in Fallbrook when, you know, at Marty's and they were up here. And, you know, we we just had one of those kind of relationships. Of course, I came out off of the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, and I went on that show in in late season nine, and stayed on it until it, it, it wrapped in season fourteen. I was standing in for Ricky to begin with. Rick and I became friends, and I was on the show and. Ozzy started throwing lines at me, but by that time, that that show was such a one of a kind. They were shooting it like they shot a movie. It was a one camera show. It wasn't a three camera setup that Lucy and Desi had created with a with an audience, uh, you know. And it was shot it was shot like a movie. So we shot five days a week on the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, and and that set was such a fun place to be. And and Marty uh, said, you know, the, the the people who are at the top of the call sheet are the ones that set the tone on a, on a, on a movie set or a television set. And Marty was just the consummate pro. And, uh, you know, the, I, I tell the tale of the first time that Marty and I actually met. I had, of course, knew about Route 66. Yeah. And, that being a one of a kind show that uh, yes that was created by Bert Leonard and they shot all over the country, uh, and then I had worked on an episode of Gidget that Marty played the big Kahuna on Sally Fields show, and I was on that episode, but I had never really met Marty face to face. And the first morning that we went out uh, on the, to shoot the pilot, we were standing in a parking lot to be picked up to take a, to be taken to location. And Marty gave out this great big yawn and he, he went, I can never sleep before I start one of these things. And I was so relieved that this professional, since he was like 13 years old and with all of his history of Marjorie Morningstar and you oh, know, yeah. you go through the, you know, the Sands of Iwo Jima, all the movies that Marty had done, that that he had, you know, uh, nerves uh, starting this thing because certainly this young guy who was doing this show, uh, meaning me, I, I looked at Marty and I said I couldn't sleep last night, and uh, you know I was so relieved that he was so open and honest about beginning this thing. And of course. Yeah. Like I said, from the beginning, we we just meshed, and uh, it was a great, great, uh, great fun. We, you know, and to be paid for it on top of it. Oh yeah, of course. 
<laughs> well, it sounds to me like it was just uh, a human being. And yeah. it also yeah. sounds to me that the rumors are true that Officer Reed really did love Officer Malloy. But yes, he did. We can yeah. take that to the bank. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, it goes back to this buddy cop thing, you know, that Mr. Webb obviously had forged with Dragnet. And, of course, yeah. you were part of that. Yeah. Well, you know, I had the good fortune. Uh, it's it's. Uh, I look back at this thing. Yesterday, my wife and I were driving on Sunset Boulevard. And right off of Sunset Boulevard, uh, going into Bel Air, there's a little park called Denise Park. And you look at it and you go, this possibly couldn't have happened there. And the thing that I'm talking about is this football game that occurred between oh, yeah. Elvis Presley and Ricky. Uh, and Rick had put together this team. And the night before we did this game, uh, a friend of mine who was going to UCLA and was a wonderful and terrific football player. And as a friend of mine, we went to high school together. I lived with his parents for a while. And Mike had come home from UCLA one night and he said, we're going to play a touch football game you want to play. And I just finished my freshman football season. And uh, I said, oh yeah, sure. I was playing. And he said, well, we're going to play on a team with Ricky Nelson, we're going to play Elvis Presley. And I went, oh, yeah, Mike, let me know when that happens. <laughs> you know, and so a couple of weeks later, Mike came home and he said, you know, the game we were talking about, we're going to play it. Uh, tonight, we're going to drive into Hollywood and meet Ricky Nelson and, do, you know, talk about some plays and stuff. And so we drove into Hollywood. I met Rick. The next day, we met at the, the Fisai house at UCLA and all caravaned over to this little park. And we played this game. Elvis shows up with all of his guys, and we started playing this game. And and uh, it it went on until it got too dark because Presley was losing, and we finally had to call the game because of the light. And and off of that, uh, Red West and Sunny West and Alan Fortis and you know we all we all became friends. And so when I was, we were driving by that that turnoff yesterday and i looked at my wife and i said a left turn here to that little park and my whole life has changed <laughs> you know isn't that uh, something no yeah and my wife and i were were dating at that time by the way we've been together for 65 years and married coming up this year for 62. oh that's amazing wonderful well congratulations on that yeah Thank um, you. And you know, even more so, congratulations on winning the football game. I yeah, yeah. I got a call. I got a call from Red uh, just oh, a few months before Red died, and uh, he said, "Pat and I are writing a book. I want to. I, I want to know about the football game." Uh, were there Rams playing in that game? And I said, no, Red, and just remember, we won. He said, yeah, but it wasn't by much. <laughs> and so, so I, you know, Red and I, Red and I were friends, you know, for, forever from that point on. And, and we worked together on a movie called John Goldfarb, Please Come Home and Room Together when we were doing that film. And, uh, and then he worked in a film that I did called A Woman's Story, that uh you know red came on and did a a little thing and of course he was working with bobby conrad on baba black sheep and so we stayed in touch and sonny his cousin and and i uh were were good friends and alan or uh, we had alan fortis and, and it was uh, uh a nephew of supreme court uh wow. judge abe fortis and and then uh jimmy kingsley who had been with presley forever came over and worked with us on Adam 12 and stood in for Marty uh, and and worked on the show for a couple of years. And, you know, so all those guys, we all became, you know, real good friends off of that. It was, uh, it was a, f a fun thing. And then I wound up working on background on a number of Presley films. I think the first location I ever went on was Viva Las Vegas. Well, it was the first location I ever went on. Not to think, but uh, oh, Anne, oh, Anne, 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 Anne. Well, I, I, I got one more question about that game, and I promise I won't yeah. go on anymore. <laughs> yeah, who played quarterback? You know, I, I, 
on our team? On both teams. Well, I think Ellis was playing quarterback on, on his team. Uh-huh. And, and we had my, my friend, Mike Hafner, who, who was the, uh, there's a legendary football player named Paul Cameron who came out of UCLA. And Mike had broken all of his freshman records as a freshman <laughs> at UCLA. So, you know, we were we were pretty loaded on that <laughs> on that front. So it was fixed, huh? <laughs> and, you know, Ricky was a great athlete. Uh, you know, when they did trapeze, and then Ricky was one of the top-rated 16-year-old nunders in tennis. I remember I was playing a lot of tennis at a point, and and Ricky gave me the the doubles <laughs> lines, and and uh, he, he 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 already gave me a point, and I was playing a lot of tennis at the time. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, that, that, uh, I, 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 I've said before, if that game had been played in the last dozen years, there would have been video of it. There would have, you know, you can't find really anything on it. It was before, you know, this was 1961. And, uh, you know, as the day progressed, that park became surrounded oh. with people. I mean, it was hundreds of people wound up during the it, but it was word of mouth then. Yep. Today, it would have been put on social media that you know the the king of rock and roll is playing <laughs> the crown prince of rock and roll a football game here <laughs> on this little postage stamp park, and and the street. You know, I mean, you, you would have had to have traffic uh, enforcement there to control what would have been happening, but. You know, that was then, and, uh, you know, so, yeah. Simpler times. Yeah. <laughs> but what a great memory, you know, and it's, so it's alive in your yeah. in your memories, and now everybody that's listening knows about it, and, and we can picture who the quarterbacks were. That was my only yeah. thing. I need to know who's throwing the ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And here's a great tie-in for you, Kent, because <clears throat> I'm just so clever at these. <laughs> you know with we it's funny but we were talking when we first got on the phone we were talking about mix because we're both a couple of mix yes yeah and i was saying mix don't mix oh and that was my bad yeah. joke but um i was earlier thinking i wonder if i should call him mick tackler because you could put any word after mick and make it yeah. work like you know mick garbage taker outer i mean you know just the <laughs> That one will be edited, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason I came up with that is that the point being, during the show, the show, we're back to the show again, was that you were the guy that always had to chase down the perp. Yeah. And it wasn't just a chase down. We're talking a full-on NFL tackle. <laughs> I enjoyed those, <laughs> by the way. That brings me to the next question. <laughs> How many of those was actually you? Uh, I would say a good 60, 70 percent of them. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And uh, and then, uh, you know, again, another another friend of mine who came out of UCLA and that we all worked background together and we're on the Presley pictures together and working background on Ozzy and Harry, the men named Craig Chudy came on and, and Craig uh, did a lot of episodes on camera uh, of Adam 12 as well as as you know doing the stunts and and uh you know so craig craig did some of those things you know there 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 weren't a lot of situations that really called for a stunt man however i always had the philosophy that stuntmen you know are are incredibly important on on action sets and should make the money and sometimes actors uh decide that they're going to do this gag uh, because they're so handy and wind up hurting themselves yep so produ- production's very reluctant to let anybody but just you know running after somebody and taking them down is is not a you know not a real dangerous thing to do maybe i mean that's yeah. the whole thing it's here's the star one of the stars of the show yeah, you go tackle them. I just, I can't imagine somebody in the production would be like, sure, just let Kent tackle them. What could go wrong, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, we had, 
uh, the the two times there were only a couple times I really hurt myself. Uh huh. And and not hurt in a, in a bad way, but one time I'm running down an embankment on the back lot, and I can't remember which episode it was. I think we were there was a body or something, and I'm going down this embankment, and they had a they had a cable that was holding up a phony tree on the back lot. And and it was under the underbrush, and I hit that cable and went ass over t huh. on that deal. And then another time, I was chasing somebody, and there was a there was a curb stepping down to the street. We were on the sidewalk, and I'm I'm sure many people have done the same thing, not running or just walking. And the step is there, and you just kind of lose your balance for so. Well, I I totally blew the, the step and went down and tore up the, the the pant leg on my you know at the knee and just skinned the knee up but that was the really the the, the only kind of injury that i ever suffered doing the show it's amazing i mean it would seem to me like okay well if we're gonna let them do it Let's have at least a couple paramedics on set, just in case. So, we didn't have that in those days. What? And that ruins my tie-in. <laughs> <laughs> Here it comes, Kent. Yeah. Let me ask you a crazy question. I'm, I'm betting. Well, I'm not betting. I'm not a betting man, but I'm thinking maybe you never had this asked of you before. Has anybody come up to you and said, excuse me, Mr. Mantooth, can I have your autograph? If I had a nickel for every time that happened, yeah, I'd be a rich man. <laughs> you know, and the funny thing about it is, is that Randy and I don't look anything alike side by side, and and but we're we're types. And if you know what film does to an individual, it takes you out of the individual and puts you into the typical. And and Randy was cast to to a to a type, and Kevin. They even had him kind of tent his hair a little to be on the ready side. Now, Bob Senator created both Adam-12 and Emergency, and uh, Bob was a genius. And so he, he you know, the, the formula, if you can call it a formula, certainly worked in both instances. But but people used to say that to me all the time about Randy. I said, no, I, I, I'm on Adam-12. Randy's on Emergency. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's it's so funny because obviously it's the, it's the blonde brunette thing and yeah. and you know the buddy cop kind of a you know the Jack Webb influence. But um, yeah. around the turn of the century, which is really weird to say, by the way, folks. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had been on General Hospital for a short while, and Randy Mantooth was on an ABC soap as well. I can't remember exactly which one it was. But we'd have these ABC soap events, uh, festivals that we'd attend together, and we made friends with him, and he is just like the sweetest, yes, wonderful guy. And he'd be like, you know, I, I loved my years playing John Gage. If only everybody didn't think I was Kent McCord. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, Randy and I, I haven't talked to him in, in, a, in a long, we were in Chicago together doing a, an event. Uh, and it's been pre-pandemic, so, and I think a couple of years pre-pandemic, so it's it's been that long. But we, we, uh, we kind of stay in touch through a, a mutual friend who was an associate producer on, on uh, Emergency Hannah Shearer. And whose father was Jack Webb's attorney for all of Jack Webb's life, uh, you know. And uh, you know, so we kind of exchanged hellos and everything. And I just got an email from Kevin just recently, you know, just you know, saying hello. And and uh, you know, they both have wonderful careers. And I know Randy wound up doing uh, a lot of stuff on on soaps there for a while. Yeah, and I know, if I'm not mistaken, he's had some health struggles in the recent past, and we, of course, all send him our best wishes. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. He's had a, a tough go of it, and I'm not versed on the particulars, so, uh, but I do know that there are, you know, these, you get to be this point in life, and uh, it's like the old 
saying is, you, you know, somebody said to somebody last night, I was watching television, what do you what do you wake up to? And he said, I just like waking up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the other thing is you look at the old and make sure your name's not there. <laughs> so. I, I just turned 60 last week, so I, here comes my third act. Yeah. And, and the, the running joke is, oh, don't worry, Pat. 60s, the new 59. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm 81 now. And, uh, you know, and so this this time frame that we're looking at, and when you say, you know, in the last century, uh, you know, more of my life was spent in the last century than it was in this one. But uh, I, I plan to even them out. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I had a friend. Uh, I have a friend. And... Uh, he, he was a race car driver, and he's a motivational speaker now, and he was going through some tough times. And I saw him back at Indianapolis, and, you know, and, and he, he, he looked phenomenal. And, and I saw that he was running in the mini marathon leading up to the Indianapolis 500, the, one of the events that they hold back there. And uh, he said, I was out running with a guy, you know, and I said, what have you been doing? You know, he says, well, you know. He said, I, I, I train and everything. And he says, you know, when you're running, and I was doing a lot of running at the time, and and how you'll find a guy who p- you can pace with and the guy that you can't keep, he'll run away from you, and then you'll finally find the guy that you can run with, and you'll finish the race. And I went up to this guy, and I thought maybe he was 55 or 60, and he was 70. And, and uh, I said, what do you do? And the guy said, you know, I live by this philosophy. If you were given given a brand new car in perfect working order and were told that was the only car you'd ever have for the rest of your life, would you take care of it? And that's the way I live my life. <laughs> my body is the only one I'm gonna have and I take care of it. You know, and I've always I've always thought that was a wonderful uh you know, kind of goal to to try to uh to try to live by sure sure well and i've seen i've seen recent pictures of you sir and you're looking pretty good man <laughs> well, we you know we I, I try to i try to keep busy well that's good what what do you do i mean is there a, do you have a routine an exercise routine or something or well we get you know my wife and i get to the gym and uh my father uh lived lived a very hard life and i think the only reason he lived as long as he did is because of hard work but i i keep busy i i just you know there's there's no one thing that i'm doing uh the pandemic threw kind of a a block to all of the uh definite routine that i had you know the gym three five you know three to five times a week bicycling uh and Really, I'm I'm kind of recovering from that time off. It was the first time in my entire life uh, since I was a youngster. And my dad brought home a, a set of weights when I was nine years old, and we had them out in the garage. Uh, that I really laid off of the kind of routine that I've done. Now, whether it was good or not, I had it in my head. I I don't want to compromise my immune system by going into a gym and dragging it down. And the other thing is. All the gyms here uh, in Southern California, well, you're you're up Central Coast, yeah, Central Coast. You know, all all the all the gyms closed their doors, and ours did for almost a year. And on my on my 80th birthday, I I went uh, a few days before my 80th birthday to our gym. I saw that it was open again to check it out, and. I decided, you know, it's an amazing uh, gym, this this one facility, and uh, I've belonged to this chain since 1984, and it's gone under, you know, different names through that, and I've always had my membership there, and uh, and this one is just the biggest gym you've ever seen with the fewest people in it at any given time. And I said, why, why, how do you keep this one open? And they said, it's the lost leader for the one, two freeway off ramps up the road. <laughs> and it's the overflow. And they just keep it going. I said, I'm surprised you guys survived the pandemic. So anyway, I started back on my routine on my 80th birthday, which was September 26th. You know, so I am still working to get back there. It's funny how when you're at this point in life, 
how difficult it is to uh, to train hard. Everything hurts. Right. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, the heck with that no pain, no gain thing. This is no pain, I'm not coming back thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I heard it said just recently, as a matter of fact, that every hour you work out adds an hour to your life. life. Well, I would think that. Yeah, I, I certainly, I certainly would uh, would buy into that. You know, you've you, you've got a, you know, your whole being is geared to some kind of work. Sure. And if you're sedentary and you're just sitting around, you, that's that's not a good formula for survival, a long life. You know. <laughs> yeah. You know, now something something may come along that that shortens it, but certainly if you do all of the things you do with diet and exercise. Uh, you're edging your bet there if you've got, uh, you know, if your biological clock says you're out of here at 90, uh, there's not much you can do about that. But you certainly can continue to live a productive life up until that point. I'd rather spend a year dying than be dying for the next 20 years. Right. <laughs> so. Right. So uh, when's your next baby due? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can hear it, folks. He's yeah. still got it. Well, yeah. <laughs> hey, gang, just a quick reminder that you can also find a slideshow version of this podcast on my Golden Rage of TV YouTube channel. There, you'll also find all my other retro TV radio celebrity interviews and my Pods with Picks playlist. The Golden Rage of TV channel is jam-packed with various other nostalgic classic TV goodies. You'll find multiple seasons of my retro TV trivia series, which pays tribute to literally hundreds of classic TV shows and their stars. These include many trivia tidbits that you may just not have known. You'll also find my music playlist of rock guitar renditions of some of our favorite classic TV theme songs, all arranged and performed by yours truly. There's also a Happenings playlist, which houses all my celebrity memoir and merchandise reviews, as well as other promotions and current events. But much like this podcast, my Golden Rage of TV YouTube channel relies on the support of folks just like you. I'm talking about a simple one-click, no-obligation subscription. These really keep the wheels turning to continue bringing you more and more nostalgic retro TV entertainment. So please, subscribe and help keep this effort charging ahead. Again, it's a simple, no-cost way to show your support for what I do. It would, of course, be greatly appreciated, and especially if you share it with a friend. Thank you in advance, folks, and now back to our show. You are the first interview that I am having since Screen Actors Guild got an agreement. Uh Interviews during that time were really tough. Yeah. (laughs) Can't talk about anything. I'm talking, well, who was it? I think it was Loretta Swit. Yeah. Don't you dare think I can't talk about MASH because I'm not (laughs) promoting it. Damn it. You know? (laughs) Yeah. And yet, well, it really gagged me, and it was very difficult. And so, I just want to say, Adam 12, Adam 12, Adam 12, um, yeah. you know, Stargate, 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 Stargate. <laughs> you know, the, uh, how, do, how do I put this? First first of all, that was uh, to pretend, you know, it, it, you know, I spent 40 years as a, as a board member, officer, committee member of the union. Yes. And, and the idea that uh, mentioning Adam-12, that's been off the air since 1975, but not off the air, is going to help Universal's bottom line it was somewhat uh, ludicrous. Yeah, I agree. You know, so we are now in the process. I'm waiting to receive uh, the contract to take a look at it. But the problem with what it, the Guild has done is we're in an area now. You know, if you if you know the history of the guild, formed in thirty three, first contract achieved in thirty seven. It was a ten year contract in forty eight. Another negotiation for a for a, an agreement. Nineteen sixty, the television thing is the big deal. Uh, movies going to television and a health plan, and the companies paid two and a half million dollars to Universal, and the guild gave them the right to show all pre-60s movies on television without compensation to any performer. Mm. And so that was a that was a huge and there there was a strike uh during that period of time in 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 1960. Now I got in right after 1960. You know, so my my 
career begins there. And then in 1972, in 70, I ran for the board. We all got wiped out. 71, uh, in 72 agreement, I was the one person off of our slate that got elected to the board of directors of the Screen Actors Guild. And I participated in the 1974 Screen Actors Guild uh, contract negotiation. And Lou Wasserman was at the table at that time. You know, and then I participated throughout uh, you know, up until 2008 in negotiations. And every time there's a new, uh, in 80, when we were talking about home video and, and we were talking about HBO and how do we participate in, in those platforms. And then in 83, we talked about cable television and all this product that's running on cable. And they asked us, please help us grow this infant cable television and we, we will negotiate these terms you know once it's matured and we you know we help them out there and we're still waiting you know and you know it's 40 years later uh that you know 43 years later and we're looking at at how we got hosed in that that agreement <laughs> and and so now you come up and there's this thing with ai there are all these platforms out there. There's all this streaming. Adam 12 right now is on three different places. This very second, too. <laughs> yes. It's called FeeV right. TV. And another one called uh, MeTV. And then a and then a streaming on FreeV TV, which is the best of them all, by the way, the FreeV uh, streaming. Uh, they haven't sped up or stretched or... Good. Done any of the things with uh, you know that they have with with the other uh, outlets, and you know the other outlets do that just so that they can gain time for commercial, mm -hmm. and you know so all of this product that we have worked in, and and by the way, you know one of the most delightful things again, um, you know that somebody needs to begin watching, uh, twelve seasons of the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet are streaming right now. And they're in a couple different places. FeeV, FreeV TV has some of them. Prime has some of them. And then I'm trying to remember where else. But we have started watching in 12 seasons. We have started watching from episode one, my wife and I. All of this was, was when Ozzy and Harry came on television, moving over from radio. They had been on radio from 1944 to 1952 when they came on television, as Dragnet had been on radio and then moved over to television. But in 1952, I was 10 years old and a huge fan of The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, as all of my family was. It was truly family entertainment, and you needed to sit down and watch this. And it's, it's up there. And so there were 435 episodes of the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. The first 12 seasons are available to watch. We're at about episode 26 of the first season. And I sit there and just, you know, having become part of the family uh, and, and watching this and then taking me back to those days when, you know, I, I can hear my mother's voice calling me to come in because Ozzy and Harriet was beginning. <laughs> and, you know, those those are things that if anybody's out there listening to this and they want pure family entertainment that has a lot of really good humor to it, they need to watch The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet and also the growth of Ricky from little Ricky, you know, with the twinkle in his eye and I don't mess around, boy, to becoming one of the challengers of Elvis Presley for the supremacy over rock and roll. And football. Yeah, and football. <laughs> oh, man. Well, and of course, they brought in Kent McCord. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's wonderful. But, you know, just getting back to what you were saying, and I mean, we don't have to talk about this too much. I just wanted to get a quick answer on what you think. Did the Actors Guild get a good deal? No. Mm. No, they didn't. You know, anytime you put the burden on the performer to seek, cons you know, where they're seeking consent by the performer to be able to digitize their image. We're in a place right now, go on YouTube and put in anybody's name, 
By the way, backtrack for a minute. When Dominic called my guy, who you had contacted, I said, I said, <laughs> I said, what's a good reason for doing Pat's show? Dominic said, you can tell people you're not dead. <laughs> now, the reason he said that is because on YouTube, on seven things that are running on there, I'm dead. And YouTube does nothing about this kind of yes. Uh, fallacy that's sitting out there. It's disgusting. I get a call, my wife does, from a cousin living in Minnesota who's, who leaves a cryptic message. Please call me. And we call her and she said, oh, God, you know, mm. it was on YouTube that you died. And then I, I get another call. I just had a 60th year reunion from my high school class and plus three because I graduated in 1960 and because of the pandemic, we didn't have one. And this class has stayed together. We've had a five-year reunion since we graduated high school. Wow. And all these friends that I grew up with. And, you know, and so I, I get a call from one of the organizers and he says, oh, thank God, how you answered. And I said, why? What's up? And I'm thinking it's related to the uh, to the reunion. And he says, oh, a friend of mine, a retired uh, El Monte police officer who's living in Arizona just called me and said, did you hear that Kent died overnight from cancer? And he said, no, I'll call. And so he calls me and he says, thank God you answered. So, and then, and then one of my best friends growing up who lived down the street from me calls me and says, I'm, I'm at the hotel for the reunion. When are we going to get here? And I said, we're just headed out and I'll be there within, you know, the next 45 minutes. And, and he walks into the thing and one of our classmates comes up to him and says, isn't it tragic that Kent died? And he says, really? I just talked to him about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> and, and so there's all this junk that's out there, and it's all clickbait. Yeah. And, and it's on, on a whole lot of actors who are out there. Sure. And the same thing happens with our images where they're, where they're taking clips, by the way, which there is a, a reuse of clips provision within the Screen Actors Guild codified basic agreement. There's a law in California called Civil Code 3344 that governs the use of your name, voice, likeness, or signature without your consent. And all of these things are are there to protect the performer. But when it comes down to product that most of our members work in, they don't own the copyright. So only the copyright holder can get a hold of YouTube and say, take this down. Mm. And now when we're into this thing of artificial intelligence and the ability to put words in people's mouths and do stuff, it, this thing has to be ironclad. And the problem with what has happened here, and I said I was waiting for the contract to get here, it's only going to be a summary of the contract. It's not the full contract. And I have friends who are asking to see the entire artificial intelligence language so that we know what we're talking about and yeah. what does consent mean and what is happening with clip use and why are we not enforcing that for all of our members when they're on on YouTube. Oh, and so YouTube is did $28 billion in business last year. It's the second most clicked on website behind Google. Yep of them all. You know, now there are things that are up there that are really quite flattering and wonderfully produced and everything. But if I attempted to do the same thing that people I don't know nor Universal knows with Adam-12, I'd get sued. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Universal would be on the phone saying, you need to do this or not, you know, to get it down. And, and uh, you know, so uh, people who who aren't part of your life are taking your image and they are exploiting it and this artificial intelligence is going to be something that is going to just there's no going back no the genie's out of the bottle and you better get it right the first time around because as i said when they came to us and said help us grow this infant meaning cable television and that is gone they're never ever gonna give up the advantage they have over performers in that platform. And this artificial intelligence thing of being able to change, uh, you know, things that you've said and and stuff and to exploit the, uh, the actor. It's a thing that I looked at this morning. Somebody said the top people in the industry, the top earners, the Tom Cruises, 
people like that are going to be able to protect themselves. But the other thing that I'm a little dismayed at after all my years on the Screen Actors Guild Board of Directors and dealing with these things is that on this contract that is going to change the industry forever, they're only sending out a summary. And no person would sign a contract obligating them for the rest of their lives under an agreement uh, without reading every word of what they were signing. So, you know, in my estimation, no, it's not a good deal. I don't think, you know, I don't think it should be uh, ratified. It, it will be because there's not a contract that's ever been sent out with the, uh, the stamp of approval of the board of directors that's ever been turned down. But, you know, it's, um, I only have to worry about what I have out there at this point in my life. Well, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that I asked this question because I knew, I knew of your past uh, with the board. And now that I know what Dominic said, it's even better because we can confirm that Kent McCord is indeed still alive. Yes. But, but I could be an AI created. Well, if you have a problem with that, you can come after me, folks. Leave him alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and the other thing is, don't gratify these channels on YouTube. They're disgusting, you know, and yeah. it is true, unfortunately, negative. Yeah. I mean, look at any newspaper, any news feed. It's all negative headlines, all of it. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's what draws the people in to want to look. You know, it's like a yeah. car wreck. You got to look, you know. Well, I said a long, long time ago when we were dealing with this, at the creation of YouTube, I said it's basically a visual Napster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Napster Napster basically destroyed the record industry, the file sharing and stuff that went on. It did. And, and you know, in, in an Interguild Council meeting probably 15 years ago, right at the dawn of, of YouTube, I looked at that and I said, they're taking copyrighted material, posting it for people to look at. And it's, it's like what was happening with file sharing with Napster. So, you know, I, I just, I say, why don't you allow each individual actor to exploit their own image without threat of suit for doing so. And, you know, it's just, it's an amazing thing that we're in when you're a performer in this uh, day and age where all this stuff can be reproduced. I've said for years that the industry would love to get back to 1939. Yeah. The greatest year in, in motion pictures, I think, that's ever that's ever been done, including you know, The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind, Stagecoach, yeah. and on down. And the difference between then and now is that then they paid the actor once, the director once, and the writer once, and the crew, and they never had to cut them another dime. You know, they owned it, and it went out there, and you know, and that's all they had to pay the actors. Then that negotiations happened because of television and the reproduction. You know, when you think about the concept of residuals, think about what happens in theater. Uh, John Barrymore is going to do John Barrymore starring in Hamlet. I don't know if he ever did. I think he did. But it's on the marquee, and then he goes and he contracts for eight performances a week. And so he gets paid for eight performances a week, and it runs whatever time it runs. At the end of it, he packs his, his Hamlet, you know, book in his wardrobe, and, his, and then he goes away. And you never see him again in Hamlet until he decides to do it again. Now, when, when the Industrial Revolution came along and they created film and the ability to capture images— all this stuff, we're looking at things on Turner Classic Movies, silent stuff, uh, you know, that, that's uh, 105 years old now, 110. And and it's going to be there for another 110 years to look at. And uh, you'll be able to see those performances. And, and you know, what Ted Turner did taught the industry a lesson. He bought MGM and he got the library. He sold the physical lot of MGM kept the library, restored all those films, and, and created three networks, TBS, TNN, and Turner Classic Movies. And and so all of that product sits out there and is, and is exhibited, you know, for all that older stuff. They owe the performers nothing. It's just amazing. So, Well, you know, 
gosh, can't thank you. That that it needed to be explained to the layman by someone that really knows their stuff. And clearly we have him on the line. <laughs> I mean, that's fantastic. And I applaud you for obviously knowing the ins and outs and having lived it. And it's just, yeah, it's it's pretty scary. Let's just keep our fingers crossed and uh, yeah, yeah, move forward, keep exercising, all of that. <laughs> well, I told, I told some friends, you know, what the Guild needs to concentrate on now is informing its members how they can use the fair use clause that's embedded in the federal government uh, to their own advantage. You know, what's fair use? If I put an episode of Adam 12 up on KentMcCord.com and I do an educational thing and say, this is what was happening behind the scenes and this is how the episode was created. Steve Cannell went out and rode around with the sergeant and freelance for, you know, every call, uh, you know, that night that he was in the car and came up with this story. <laughs> is that is that free fair use? Do I, does Universal have the right to tell me I can't educate the, the uh, population about how Adam-12 was made and run every episode? Because every episode of Adam-12 was on YouTube at one point. Sure. You know, I don't know if it's still there. I haven't looked. I, I hate to even click on these things because it's <laughs> yeah. kind of a— With your eyes closed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a kind of a self-perpetuating issue with, you know, the more clicks, somebody's getting paid. Yeah. So— well, it's a two-headed dragon, you know. Yeah. I'm a YouTube channel, and, and I, I put all my episodes up on YouTube, and I do. But what I do is tributize. That's different. You're not pilfering a library and re-editing product. Right. And then, and then putting your own spin on that. Right. You're doing, you're doing something. This is, you know, as an exhibition platform, uh, that's, that's a far different thing yeah. than than then reaching into something where there's a collectively bargained agreement on reuse of photography and then putting something up where I put in Clint Eastwood's name, put in Laurie Sheen's name, put in Randy Mantus's name, go through the, you know, go through the whole thing and see what kind of product sits there and see how someone has taken that product and created their own commercial exploitation of that product. And they and it's basically being done with impunity. Yeah, or they call it editorial. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if if I call YouTube, and by the way, uh, on the thing about me, you know, my dying on this thing, <laughs> uh, somebody did contact YouTube and inform them of the seven platforms that they found, and it's still there. Yeah. So, so it's kind of looking at freedom of speech. He's dead, and I said it, and I can say whatever I want because this is America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, people go on and say some people are dead, and they cause you know, and they say, "Well, that kind of a harmless BS." Well, it wasn't to my no. It wasn't to my classmate's adult daughter who called her crying. No, that I had died. Yeah, and and you know, or my wife's cousin who called in a panic you know so those are the kinds of things that get put out there and you know it's like why did you climb that mountain you know well because it was there so people think that uh well i can have fun with this and i get it i can do it you know but take the high road yeah yeah that you know you've heard of that right well it doesn't get any clicks look i you know, I'm the devil's advocate here. It's like, okay, but my YouTube channel. But it, everybody will tell you that the hundreds of videos that I have that are up there all are to tributize, to send the love of what you guys did yeah. in classic television and point yeah. out things that maybe you didn't know. All of it, lighthearted, uplifting. You know, that's... That's my ammo, and so I use it for that. No, no, there's, there's no doubt that, uh, hear what I'm saying. If I did the same thing that many of these things uh, exhibit, if I turned my career into a cottage industry, exploited on a Kent McCord channel on YouTube, I would get cease and desists in a heartbeat because they have my my telephone number and my address they when i brought this up uh years ago the word i got back is they're not interested they're chasing the current stuff 
and they're not interested in chasing down the old stuff. Hmm. And so, so it's it's really kind of a funny thing when you look at uh, you know I've been doing this for sixty one years now, and and to watch the progress of this, and also having sat in on all of these negotiations that are there to protect the performer from exploitation is is in this new universe is somewhat dismaying that other people can exploit you but you may not exploit yourself <laughs> you know think about that think about how you know unbelievable yeah it's just like what the guild said when they said well you know you can't go out and talk I had a I had a personal appearance I was going to do, and because of the pandemic continuing on, uh, and my wife and I go nowhere where we're in public where we don't mask. Uh, to this day, I just talked to a good friend of mine who just is recovering from COVID. They got a little careless, and uh, you know, and so when we go to the market or we go to a mall or you know, when we're closing in on any place where there's a lot of people, we up the mask and uh you know and try to be very careful and this is where we're going to jump back because i just lost my train of thought <laughs> i got off i went into co i was attacked by covid all of a sudden <laughs> doing battle in so many fronts here <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean look I, I am so glad that I opened that can of worms because it, it really needed to be talked about. I had been feeling the effects of it with my interviews, so of my interviewees. And clearly, we're talking to an authority here, folks, that knows the score. And, you know, yeah, again, fingers crossed. Well, and well like, like uh, I, I know where we were headed. I got into the reason why I didn't go on this personal appearance was because of the, uh, my both my neighbors uh, – got on airplanes to go somewhere and came back and both had COVID. Mm -hmm. And I went, you know, geez, you know, doing doing this appearance uh, is one thing. It's getting there. Yeah. That's that's the other, to go to LAX and get on an airplane and, yep. you know, and how do you, it, you know. Uh, but when it, it was during, it was during the strike that I was going to do this appearance and they said, well, you can't promote Adam. I said, what? <laughs> Yeah. Well, you can't, you know, and you can't. Uh, yeah. Don't you say can't have Don't pictures, you know, with, <sighs> with of Adam. Tw I said, uh, you are you kidding <laughs> me? You know, and you signed interim agreements with, you know, the performers are out doing this, and you know, you can't separate the two. I'm sorry, you know, I'm, no. I'm tied to that, you know, for the rest of my life, and uh, uh, you know, it's not like it's gonna it's gonna enhance, like I said earlier, Universal's bottom line. Right. That, uh, that I mentioned Adam 12. So, well, what it all comes down to is the fact that the works that you did are all incredibly full of talent. You know, you're just a talented guy and you just put it out there. And but you took it one step further and you, you became an activist for good in real life for these people, not just as a cop on TV. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'm. You know, I, I, I'll jump jump in here for a second because I, I, I come by it honestly. When my father was dying, my dad said, boy, without the union, your mother and I would have had nothing. And he was a boilermaker. He welded hmm. all of his life. He was a hardworking man. And, and that boilermaker's union gave him a pension. And, uh, you know, so union was always in my blood. Uh, going to union picnics on Labor Day, uh, in in that kind of uh, you know that kind of upbringing, and and when I was uh, a contract player at Universal and starting Adam Twelve, there were some things that ha that happened on the show uh, uh, from from management, uh, and I showed up at a at a. Screen Actors Guild membership meeting at the Palladium in Hollywood here and got to a microphone and I said, if this is happening to me, I'm starring in a show. And if this is happening to me, what's happening to the day player? Yeah. You know, and and so I, I was invited to address the board and then I was approached to run and I went, yeah, okay. 
And so, you know, that began my journey with, with the Screen Actors Guild. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's fantastic. And, and by the way, if you want a seat at the table with management, you better be a member of a union. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's that's the, the way you get heard. You know, going in as an individual, they'll just you know, no, blow no. you off. No, no, no. It's a good union. And it's like, like you were saying, you better be. Um, yeah. But, okay, so there's your reputation. You're living up to it, Kent. Um, as one of the nicest people in show business. And I don't know <laughs> if you've you. never heard that one before, Mr. Mantooth, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll tell Captain Cordell when I see him. Yes, please do. <laughs> start, start an IV with lactate and ringers, and I'll meet you there. Yeah. But I, yeah. I, I, I was going to say, I, I have a very dear friend um, by the name of Kathy Garver, Yes. And I, I was texting with her just a couple days ago, and I said, you know what? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to interview Kent McCord. And she said, oh, Kent, he is such a nice guy, dot, 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 yeah. for a cop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I went, hmm. She did an episode with us in, yeah. in, with Barbara Hale yes. playing her mother and Bill Williams playing a bad guy. Yeah. You know. And she was a bad girl. Yeah. And she was, you know, who the, you know. Uh, the anti-sissy is what I called it. <laughs> yeah. 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 She's a wonderful woman. She really, really is. My my energizer bunny is what I call her because she just goes and goes and is just my inspiration. and. Now you two are both my inspirations, Mr. McCord, and this has just been fantastic. I could not have asked for a better interview. And yes, folks, he's still alive, obviously. (laughs) So as far as this podcast goes, we're going to let Mr. Kent McCord get back out on his beat. Ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful, I'm going to say it, dashing (laughs) Kent McCord. Thank you, sir. Well, you're quite welcome, Pat. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for joining me on the Season 4 premiere of the Retro TV Radio Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and leave a positive rating. It all helps. You can follow me on social media at Golden Rage of TV on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, and on X at Golden Rage of TV One. Once again, this is your host, Pat McCormack, and thanks for listening to Retro TV Radio. Retro TV Radio.